And this situation, however we are in a, in a fallen way, is brought about by our own sin. But God has other plans, plans to renew everything, to bring humans back into relationship with him and the universe back to how it was designed to be. And the way he's doing that, and will continue to do it until it's complete, is through this thing called the gospel. Now, careful saying is a thing, but you get where I'm going, hopefully. As we saw in the first week of this series, this is a three-week series for those who are just here today. Uh, in the first week, the gospel, we summarized it like this. The gospel is the message of salvation and restoration sent from God the Father, embodied in Jesus Christ, illuminated by the Holy Spirit and described in the Bible. So it's God's great rescue mission for mankind at great expense to himself. And why is it necessary? Well, it's because we're all sinners. And we have to face up to that fact first, that we're all sinners before we can accept the truth of the gospel. And this is where we can see that, even though I mentioned him last week, Israel Palau again, his now infamous, if you like, Instagram post was perfectly in line with the gospel. So if liars, idolaters, and yes, homosexuals, don't know that they're condemned by their actions, they won't know they need to be rescued. And if this all is Izzy was trying to do, and personally I say, good on you, mate, but I'm pretty sure it was all he was trying to do, just stand up for what was true. Now, I hope they don't let him beat him down too much, but he could cost him quite a bit on, by the look of things. But the fact is the truth will set us all free, won't it? It's the truth. Because every one of us in Israel, for would include himself in that list. We're all in there somewhere on that list, one way or another, if in thought, if not in action. I remember Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, even if you think it, it it's still counts against you. It's still sin. So the point is we all need the gospel. We all need to be rescued. So how do we get on board with this rescue mission? That's kind of the question, isn't it? If we picture it as Jesus reaching down his hand to us, how do we accept his invitation to take and take his hand? Because I mean, it's a figurative thing. How do we don't literally take his hand? So, so thankfully the Apostle Paul puts it pretty neatly in Romans 10 verse 9. You probably all heard this verse, I hope. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So it's about what you believe. Because the confess part as well, that comes from obviously the initial belief because what you say and you confess comes from um, simply a communication of what you believe. It's in your heart. And to believe is another way of saying to have faith or to trust or even to entrust. To entrust. You entrust yourself into the hands of the only one who can save you from eternal death. So it's like you're drowning, so that's the picture there, and that hand reaches out to you, that's Jesus' hand. How crazy would you be not to take it? But if you don't realize you're in the water, you're drowning, then you won't take it. That's the problem. That's what we need to get to the point where we understand that. So that's how you take the hand of rescue. Simply trust in his ability to do it and to want to do it. Because Jesus is who he says he is, the only way, and he can do what he says he can do save us and we can do nothing to help him with that all we can do is simply fall into that salvation and let him carry us really now then hopefully we can see why resurrection is important firstly because someone who's dead can't save you can they (laughs) it's a bit hard so that that bit's pretty straightforward but it, it goes a fair bit deeper than that because it's not the kind of life that we already have that Jesus saves us into. Not at all. It's the kind of, this kind of life that we have now. It won't cut it for heaven. And like I just said, we can and will die, unless Jesus comes first, of course. But if we're going to be with God forever, since he's eternal, then we need the kind of life that's going to be able to handle that eternal existence, what the Bible calls eternal life. And thankfully, that's the kind of life that Jesus brings. So that's part of the good news too, isn't it? It's that kind of life. 
because it's the kind of life that he has. In fact, he's the one and only source of it. So you can only believe in Jesus and his ability to save if you are convinced that he can bring that kind of life, even to little old you and me. And that comes about by hearing the gospel and responding to it, which is how the reading we just had before ended, right? If you remember that last verse, John reminds us of his purpose in writing the gospel down. That's, this is often taken as the summary verse of the, of the whole book, John twenty thirty one. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So do you see the process there? There's a bit of a process he puts to us in that verse. See, firstly, the gospel is articulated, in this case written, and then obviously we understand it from what's written and spoken. The person believes through the gospel as the Holy Spirit opens his or her heart to the, to the truth. And then eternal life comes to that person as the Holy Spirit who opened their eyes now it moves in and brings it to them. And from this moment, because these two last ones happen sort of in a blink of an eye pretty much, that person is regenerated, reborn in spirit, or born again, and their destiny is only ever from that time on, eternity with God, since he or she is now God's child in his family. So that's what it means to have life in his name. It's a life that begins even now for those who, ha- who have confessed Christ and from that moment of surrender to God when we take on the family name from then. But it comes into full reality when we see Jesus face to face, of course. Which is really Jesus' own definition of eternal life. Because if uh, those who are familiar with John might know there's another verse in John where Jesus actually defines eternal life. It's back a few chapters in 17... Verse 3, so Jesus the Son is praying to the Father and this is what he says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So you can see eternal life there is equated with relational knowledge of God. So his eternal life flows to us by faith tried to represent that. It says eternal life in the green there. It's a bit hard to read, sorry. But that eternal life flows to us in that relationship. Now, why? Because you can only know God when you have His Spirit living in you. And to have His Spirit living in you means you have eternal life in you. So it's interesting that the verse before this one, so verse 2, has strong links to our passage in chapter 20 as well. And I'll show you that. So Jesus' prayer starts out in verse 1. So this is the bit immediately before, obviously, verse 3. So verse 1, Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Verse 2, Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And so on the first day of Jesus' resurrection life, that was when all this stuff in chapter 20 happened, that we, the, the readings that we've had today so far. That was on the first day. So it was on that Sunday night, the evening after the women went to the tomb and found it empty. So it's natural that Jesus sets about fulfilling what he says here in in 17 verse 2 about giving eternal life to those God had given him. So I think that's the significance of Jesus breathing on the disciples there in chapter 20 verse 22. See, he was demonstrating a few things with that, but the main thing I think was that he was bringing eternal life, that Holy Spirit into them. Now we need to be careful there. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not just some magical vapor that you know somehow brings eternal life to whoever it touches, no matter who it is, or if you get in the right place at the right time, you can just inhale it or something. That's not how it works. No, he's personal, so he only comes where he's welcome. So with their previous three years of working with Jesus, and then they'd just seen him um, crucified and then risen, that meant they were, they were very happy to welcome Jesus into their lives in the Holy Spirit. And it's the same for us. If you welcome him into your life, if, if you realize that even though you're a sinner, 
he will forgive you and take care of all that, then he will come in. Before that, each of us is dead in our sins. But once Jesus comes into us by his Holy Spirit, death passes away and we are alive with eternal life. So those who are saved, we have eternal life and our natural life with us as well. But um, and I think Oswald Chambers actually put this fairly well. He says this, Eternal life is not a gift from God. Eternal life is the gift of God. As in, God himself is the gift. It's the gift of God. And that's the big difference that Resurrection Sunday makes compared with Good Friday. And what I mean by that is Jesus' death and resurrection serve different purposes. So they're both obviously critical in saving us because you can't resurrect until you die first. That's one thing. But how does it all work together to fix us up? That's kind of what I'm trying to get to. So if the gospel is God's rescue mission for mankind and Jesus' death and resurrection is central to that plan, then what does it actually do? Well, to show you about that, I'm going to bring up this picture. Anyone know what's happening in this photo? I didn't, wasn't aware of this until I came across this. Sorry? No? Well, it's, it's actually, we can see it's President Trump with a few people with him. But he's issuing a pardon in May 2018 for the crimes committed by the black boxer Jack Johnson. Now, I don't think many people in Australia have heard of Jack Johnson. Not the boxer, perhaps the musician. He's a whole different thing. <laughs> he's a lot whiter. But no, Jack Johnson, he's a the black boxer. And the reason you probably haven't heard much about him is that he, he died in 1946. So this is what you call a posthumous pardon. A pardon after you're dead. Now, I won't get into all the backstory there, but I'll just bring this up to help us realise something important about the kind of work that Jesus did. Because let's think this through. How does the President's pardon help Jack Johnson? Not particularly. He's dead. <laughs> it might help some people who are alive today, who, who um, like his family perhaps, they might feel better about it. And, and those who appreciate him, and perhaps like the people like Sylvester Stallone. Can you see he's up there? Just two. Yeah, Sylvester Stallone and um, Lennox Lewis. A few of the big names are in that photo. But Jack Johnson doesn't benefit at all because he's six foot under, you know. So it's really just a symbolic gesture of goodwill, and that's all it really comes down to. But the problem is, many try to assign Christ's Christ sacrifice the same sort of level of credit. People kind of say, you know, it was a generous and selfless act by a poor preacher from Galilee 2,000 years ago, but it really doesn't make much difference to me. You know, I appreciate the sentiment, but that's about all. And so many people kind of think that about Jesus' death. You know, good on him. You know, he did his best, but how does it affect me? But that's the huge difference between what they say and what Jesus actually did, what it actually means. So the difference is in the fact that not only does he have the power to grant us a pardon, but far more amazingly, he has the power to give us the eternal life needed to enjoy the pardon. And not just enjoy it, but to live together with him forever. So you see the difference. You can give a posthumous pardon, fine, but you don't actually get any benefit. But Jesus brings us the benefit by bringing us to life. And that, um, Romans 4.25 talks about that. And it's what we're going to spend our remaining time just mostly unpacking this verse. Well, a little bit anyway, because there's... It's very, very deep you could go with this, but just want to um, dig a little into this. So Romans 4.25 says this. Paul writes that Jesus was deli delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Okay, so he says Jesus was delivered up. What does that mean? Well, as you can probably tell, he's talking about crucifixion. But the hint we often miss here is that to be delivered up Someone has to do the delivering. And who would that be? Well, no, but yeah, he um, did the, just the, um, the, what did he do? Tra traitor job. <laughs> but God the Father actually delivered him up. That's what it, Paul's implying here. Because remember, God so loved the world, John 3.16, that he gave 
his only son, that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. So God the Father gave God the Son up for our sakes to be crucified in our place. Yes, we deserve that cross ourselves, but God delivered him up for us, for us in the sense of in our place. And why? For our trespasses, in other words, our sins. Because we've all sinned and we're all condemned by a holy God. We're all on Israel's list there somewhere. Israel Falau, that is. Every single one of us, me, you, little lovely old Nana, she's on there too, sorry. Each one of us has sinned and those sins need to be paid for. But we can't afford to pay it. We don't have the funds. Only the blood of Jesus can atone for sins. And that's exactly what happened on the cross. So Jesus was delivered up so that his death would deal once and for all with every person's sins. Now they're all paid for. Another part of the good news, let's put that in that box too, in the good news box. That's great news. And that's still only part of the greater news that is the full gospel. Because if that was all, if Jesus just died for our sins, so we'll chop off the picture there and just do the first two parts. If Jesus just died for our sins and stayed dead, then we still wouldn't be saved. Why? Well, because like Jack Johnson, we would still be dead. And therefore, well, he would still be dead, sorry, and so would we. <laughs> and we are dead in the sense that we don't have the kind of life that can exist with God in the new heavens and new earth that are coming. And it's a spiritual separation from God that we're talking about. So the kind of life we need, if we're going to benefit from our official pardon, is eternal life. It's the life of the Spirit of God, which is the same thing as the life of the Son of God, Jesus life of Yahweh therefore Paul also says that he was raised so that's, we've just dealt with the first half of the verse there so he was raised that is Jesus died and came back to life again so that's amazing in itself that the author of life died that he even could die how does that work I still can't get my head around that because I'm sure that that was something especially that the disciples really had to grapple with in those days between his death and resurrection, that the realization that the man who could raise people like Joris' daughter and Lazarus from the dead was now dead himself. How would that... That's some cognitive dissonance there, I think. How was it possible? How Could that possibly be God's plan? Or had something gone horribly wrong? But that's how it is with God's plan sometimes, right? You can ha- you know, we can find ourselves in a position that we know for sure God's got it wrong. He couldn't possibly have let this happen. There's no way that he would have let Jesus die. It's just, it's just too wrong. And why has he let these bad things happen to me? That's just, just too wrong. That can't be right. My life's got too many problems. This world's just in too much of a mess. No, clearly God's either lost control or lost interest. That's what's happened. Is anyone tempted to think like that? Yeah, I'm sure the disciples of Jesus did between his death and resurrection but that's where we need to remember God is always in control he never lets anything go further than his plan for it to go and the question each of us has to ask ourselves is do we trust him with that or let's shorten that still do we trust him full stop do we trust him all those things that happen in life God places there that so that he's constantly posing that question to our hearts. Do you trust me? Because we might think that Jesus' death is the end, but he knows, as Glynis pointed out, Sunday is coming. Sunday morning will bring us something special. And that something is the new life, new hope, new joy. And that was the response of all of Jesus' followers who saw him alive again. Joy. And that's just response from having the one you love back with you they weren't aware of everything else that was behind this probably at least not at that stage so yes there's something far deeper in his return and that was the fact that he now brought with him eternal life he had a different kind of body and could bring that same kind of eternal life to those who receive it by faith so there was some great truth in that statement Paul makes in Romans 4.25 about Jesus being raised And so 
what is the significance of this raised Jesus for us? He was raised for our justification. Okay, so what's justification? Now those who are regular here have heard me talk about this quite a bit, but let me just explain it for those who haven't heard. Justification is simply the means, or sorry, what it simply is, it means to be put right in our relationship with God. And that's not only by Jesus paying for our sins, certainly that's a necessary part of it as we've just seen, but it's not the end of it. To be in right relationship with God, we need to have eternal life, right? Because that's what God has. For the same reason that Donald Trump can't have a relationship with Jack Johnson, because only one of them's alive. So Jesus' death clears the way for the relationship to happen, but his resurrection brings us that eternal life in himself, so that if we are in Christ, we have that kind of life too. So justification is the same thing as being born again, being spiritually regenerated, or becoming a child of God. That's all different phrases meaning the same kind of thing. So through faith in Jesus Christ, we are now legitimate sons and daughters of God because the guilt of our sin is no issue anymore and we're reborn with eternal life. Okay, so to summarize this verse, let's, let's paraphrase it a bit. Jesus died to deal with the guilt of our sin and he resurrected to bring us the gift of eternal life. Now, I think that's pretty good news, don't you? <laughs> yes, that's awesome news because it's something that can give us the kind of hope we need to push on through all the stuff that life throws at us day in and day out because our hope is not in an ideology. It's certainly not in money. It's not in our job. It's not in celebrities please. <laughs> Certainly not in politicians. Keep that in mind in the next few weeks. It's in a person who has ultimate authority and showed that by defeating death and being eternal life personified. It's the resurrected Jesus Christ. And that's the gospel, right? He's the gospel. He's the gospel incarnate. So as we wrap it up this morning, the question is now, do you believe this? Because by believing, by faith, this is eternal. That's, that's how eternal life comes to each of us. We can't inherit it by being born into a Christian family. We can't earn it by being a good person. We can't buy it with money or possessions or anything. All we can do is acknowledge that everything that needs to be done has been done by Jesus. He paid our debt by dying and he brought us life by resurrecting. And when those things are combined, we have the heart of the gospel, the death and the resurrection. And, that, and that's what it's all about. That's what today's all about, to celebrate that good news, that God's alive and he's calling us to go forward with him. So as we enjoy our Easter eggs and hot cross buns and whatever else we do over this weekend, let's make sure we never forget the heart of the gospel is the message of this resurrection day. Good news, Jesus is alive. Everything else flows from that truth. So I hope that's an encouragement. Let's pray. Lord, it does set us back a little bit just as we realize what you went through and what you did and what it means for us, Lord. There's eternal fruit in what you've done in dying and rising again for us. So we thank you for this. We thank you that you want us to spread that word and you want us to encourage each other. So please help us to do that now with your spirit inside us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.